And this morning we're going to talk a bit about property boundaries and some of the laws related to property boundaries. Oops, keep forgetting to do that. There we go. The uh, after today you'll know a bit more about how to identify your property boundaries and some of the some of the origin of how they were first established. And then uh, we'll finish with a discussion on some of the common laws that affect you as woodland owners, including the recreational use statute, the trespass law, the uh, fence law, and doesn't that sound fun? <laughs> Let's move on. Okay, so why is it important to know and identify your property boundaries? Well, there's a number of good reasons to do that. First one is that uh, if you're doing a timber harvest on your property, commercial timber harvest, where there's loggers on your land cutting timber and they happen to stray onto your neighbor's property, that's against the law, actually. It's called timber theft, and there's some hefty fines associated with that, so you want to make sure that anybody that's cutting timber on your property is staying on your property, and vice versa if your neighbor's cut cutting timber. You uh, Trespassing is a very common thing taking place in our state, and it's a good idea to, to know, or if you, you probably want to know if someone is using your walking across your property or using it to get somewhere else or something else. It's good to know if that's actually true or not and if you know where your property boundaries are you can say for sure either way. And there's this thing called adverse possession which is uh, where someone takes ownership of your property by using it over an extended period of time. And in fact we'll talk about these last two, these the trespass and adverse possession, the laws associated with those. Uh, towards the end of the presentation but there if you know where your property boundary is and you um, and you look at it every year to make sure none of these things are happening you'll be better off overall the uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that our boundaries are changing all the time it might be that you have a neighbor you've had the same neighbor for decades and all of a sudden they decide to pass their land on to their kids and the, there's three of them and they divide the land up into equal thirds and all of a sudden instead of one neighbor you have three and none of them have a good idea where the property boundaries are and, and all of a sudden you have to reestablish these uh, all the relationships that you had with one with three and make sure that everybody's clear where boundaries are so those are just some of the reasons that you might want to know where your property boundaries are where your corners are and to be aware of them over the long term now a lot of the properties that we have here in Wisconsin have never been surveyed so uh, we might have a legal a description of where our, where our property is located within the landscape within a township or a county but there's there's no uh, real description as to exactly where the corners are and so in our tax bill we might get a uh, a listing of a string of numbers and letters like this one here that describes exactly where your property is located and it actually at the end it describes Oops, it describes how many acres your property is. And so how to read this? And it always starts from the smallest unit of land and goes to the largest. So this reads as the southern half of the northeast quarter of the southeast quarter of Section 24 in Township, township 33 North, Range 9 East. And so I will go through this, uh, and here's, here it is in, in words too, and I'll go through this in more detail later on, but uh, that's, that's what you might see on your tax bill is a, a real kind of vague description of where your property is where your but it doesn't list anywhere any kind of description of where your corners are located and and where the boundaries are between those so in the 1830s when the general land office opened Wisconsin up to uh, settlement they had to do some surveying first to establish where these uh, divide up the the state into counties and townships so that people could figure out exactly where their land is located and to do that, they established an initial point of survey, which is an inter intersection of this line called the a baseline, Wisconsin's baseline, and the fourth principal meridian, which runs north-south. So all of the surveys that, all the survey crews that went out in the, in the 1830s to establish the corners for the townships within each county started their journey at this intersection right here called the initial point of survey. And so, the state is, uh, over the next few decades, the entire state, all the townships within the state were surveyed, and uh, following after them came county crews that would, that would survey within the townships. And I'll, they'll break down those units a bit more in a few minutes, but that's, that's how our land is divided up. First we have counties, and then within each county we have townships, and that's, those are just uh, ways to describe the land, the units of land within the state. Now it's going to get complicated in a second. And that's because uh, we, and 
the way we describe where you are in the state also uses the word township, townships and ranges and sections. And it's all based on your distance from this initial point of survey where the baseline and the principal meridian meet. And so everything, your land is, the way your land is described, the location is described is based on its distance from this initial point of survey. So say you own land in this bit of land right in this in this township right here. And so your the way you describe the land is your distance from the, the principal the uh, initial point of survey, sorry, initial point of survey. So you own land in this township right here. So it would be described as one, two, three townships north and one range west. I know that we use township as a descriptor of land, but it's in it, and then we also use it as a descriptor of distance from the initial point of survey. So it can be confusing, but each one of these squares, these six by six miles by six miles squares, is a township, and we describe where it is located in relation to this initial point of survey as number of townships north or south of it. So I'll, a few more examples. Say you own this parcel, you own land within this township right here. So you would be the location would be described as one, two townships south of the baseline, and one range east of the principal meridian. Now we don't say baseline and principal meridian all the time, we just say uh, township one north or range one east. That's how it, the description is. And then you remember if that baseline was right at the bottom of Wisconsin, so there are no townships south uh, in Wisconsin, they're all townships north. So let's go to another example, how about this one right here? Say you own land in this township here. Your legal description would be you is one, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to click on that. One, two, three townships north and one, two ranges west. So it's three townships north of the baseline and two ranges west of the principal meridian. Now I've given this presentation before and I may misspo misspeak as to these uh, ranges and, and uh, townships and their location. Uh, so if I make a mistake, Chris will be happy to jump in and tell me that I messed up, and I'll make sure I'll correct myself. So it could happen, but those, but that's how it's described. So, but but all of us don't own a whole township of land, six miles by six miles. Very few of us own that much land. More often than not, we own a part of land, a, a small portion of the land within that township. And so, they've the the, the great thinkers decided to divide the township up into what are called sections and there's 36 sections each section is one mile by one mile within a township and this is the arrangement of all the townships this is where they're always arranged starting in the upper right hand corner the numbers kind of serpentine their way down to the lower right hand corner to the number 36 and that they're all arranged the same way and they, they can get some funky numbering if there's uh, only a part of a township, maybe it butts up against a river or something, and so there's only a part of a township there. And so the arrangement can get kind of funky, but this, when they're mostly square, this is the way the arrangement will be in every, in every one. And each section is 640 acres, each section, sorry, each section is 640 acres. So the township, this is a township, it's six miles by six miles. Within a township, there are 36 sections, each section is one mile by one mile, or 640 acres. All right, so let's keep moving. <laughs> now, not all of us own a whole square mile of land, or 640 acres. Most of us own smaller units than that. And so we've divided up, or figured out a way to describe our ownership based on owning parts of a section. And when, we, when people first started uh, settling in the state, they would own a part of a section. They might own the northern half, or the western half, or the southwest one quarter, or the or, or something like that. It's a it's a part of or a fraction of that that total amount of land within the section. And so it was easier, given that 640 acres, you can divide these up into fairly uh, good number or acres that are fairly a round number. So if you own, let's say, the, this part of the section, let's call this section one, you own this part of the section, the, the northern part of the section, you own uh, 320 acres of land. And so your legal description would be the northern half of section one. This is section one. You own the northern half of section one. That's the way your legal description would read, 320 acres. Okay. But let's say you own less than that. Let's say you own only a quarter of it. And let's say it happens to be a quarter, this quarter of this section one. 
So your legal description would be the northwest one quarter or northwest quarter of section one, 160 acres. And you can get different kinds of divisions within a, a section. Maybe you own this part. These 80 acres is the part of the uh, section that you own. And so it's, it's kind of, it's half of this quarter and, then it's, and that's located in this quarter. So the description is you own the western half of this quarter. And so it's the western half of the northeast quarter. This is north is the top, south is the bottom, west is over here, east is over here. So it's the western half of the northeast one quarter. Now, if you're having problems, feel free to send Chris a note or send us a note saying, I'm not getting it. I'll be happy to describe it further, but I'm going to keep going. Let's say you own less land than that, too. Let's say you own this part of land right here, this 40-acre parcel right here. And so it's in this, this southwestern part of the, the section, and it, but it's in the north eastern part of this of this particular quarter. And so the description would read, you're this 40 acres, you own this 40 acres. It's the northeast one quarter of the southwest one quarter of section one, 40 acres. And you can get very descriptive with these all the way down to two and a half acre pieces and they can be the, the legal description can be quite long. But it's you can get down to let's let's try this one right here. So this is the northwest one quarter of the southeast one quarter of the southeast one quarter of section one. How are we doing, Chris? Anybody, anybody having problems or expressing that they're having problems? So far, so good. Excellent. Okay. We can go over this again towards the end if you'd like, but uh, I think I'm going to move on. Now, if you do happen to have a survey associated with your property, you might have some other things, uh, units of length to, to think about. The What will happen is a survey will come in and they'll start from a known point of uh, a known, maybe it's a, a township corner that's been well established and very well documented. They might start their measurements there to a corner of your property because all you have is listed in your description as the south, southern half of of Section 26, Township 9 North, Range 3 West, or something like that. So they'll start from a known point and measure take, using take an azimuth or a degree measurement and uh, and measure the length. They can figure out they can get a start figure out exactly where the corners are to your parcel. And if you've had a, a very old survey done, you might see some some of these kind of units in it. It might see a link or rods or a chain, and, and um, I want to spend a little time talking about a chain here. And a chain is a unit of measure equal to 66 feet. Now that seems like an odd thing to, to choose as a length of measure. Why not 70 feet or, or 100 feet? But it turns out that works out really well because there's exactly 80 chains, there's 80 of these 66 foot lengths in equal to one mile. Now let me go back to the, the previous slide. So if we know that there's 80 chains to a mile and say you do own this entire section, it's one mile by one mile. You know the distance from this corner to this corner is a mile or exactly 80 chains. Now you can figure out how to measure a chain using just your pace. And actually in, uh, when I was in taking, as a forestry undergraduate student, we were taught how to do exactly that, how to measure 66 feet or a chain just using our pace. My pace happens to be 11 steps, or you measure it, you count every other step. It might, it's different for everybody. And in fact, we have a great publication on our website that's on Compass of Pace that describes how to figure out exactly what your pace is. But say you want to figure out exactly how to, where's my pointer, there it is, how to figure out how to, where this corner is, so you know where this corner is, but not this one. You know if you if you walk 80 chains, you'll get exactly there. And or maybe you own the, this this quarter section in the southwest quarter here, and you know this corner, but you don't know this one. If you walk 40 chains, you'll you'll find where this corner is. And the same if you own just this 40 acre parcel. If you walk 20 chains, you'll find where this corner is here. And it's actually a pretty accurate way to measure distance once you've had practiced it enough. And I encourage you to get out and try it. It's something fun to do, especially with your family, is to try to figure out exactly how to measure, or using, using your pace to measure distance. That is, you can, if you have a couple of people and a lot of time, you can measure, you can stretch out a tape measure to measure distance. A hundred foot tape, that can take a long time. It's a, a lot more accurate. If you're doing this by yourself, getting out 
uh, with your compass and, and, and using your pace, you can actually get pretty close to where you're supposed to be in finding a corner. Now, there's also things like GPS units I'm going to talk about in a few minutes that you can use too, but it's to try something fun, I encourage you to get out and uh, try your, your hand at measuring distance with your pace. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about with it was our unit of acre, and acre is equal to 43,560 feet, which again seems like an odd number. Why not 45,000 square feet or 50,000 square feet or something like that? And that's because uh, we were stuck with this unit, like we're stuck with a pound. Someone had said this rock equals a pound, and so everything has to be measured against this rock. And so they established this unit of land measure as an acre, and they described it as, when it, this was obviously probably might even be hundreds of years ago, they described it as the amount of land that can be plowed in a day by an oxen. So it's the amount of land that can be worked in a day by an oxen equals to one acre. And so that's how they described it. Obviously, we've measured it a bit more accurately and precisely nowadays, but that's how it originally started. So feel free to use that little tidbit of knowledge uh, to share with your friends and impress them. Okay, so let's say that this is your property description. The southeast one quarter, the northwest one quarter, section 21, township 2 north, range 3 west. So that's so you want to find that on a plat book in a plat book and a plat book is just a graphical description of property ownership within a township, and so you have to figure out exactly what uh, where it is you want to you want to see that graphical display of your property ownership within a, within a plat book and so you have to get there and you usually to get there you have to start from the big unit to work your way down, and so you have to find the you have to find the right pages within the plot book to get there. But let's let's do this uh, right away, right from the beginning. So you own from Township Two North, Range Three West. So here's our initial point of survey. Here's the baseline, and here's our principal meridian. So it's Township Two North, One Two North, Range Three West, One. Oh, I did it again. I apologize. Range Three West, One Two Three West. So this is the township we will be working in. This is where your land is located, somewhere in here. So let's get more detail. Now we're in section 21, and so within this township, we go uh, 21. Here we are. Now within that, we're in the southeast one quarter, the northwest one quarter. Well, the northwest one, northwest one quarter is right here, and the southeast one quarter within that is right there. So that's a good way, easy way to find your ownership with, within a plat book. Um, and hopefully, if, it, if, it's, if you've owned it long enough, your name will even be in there, and so you know exactly where it is. But you can see as you, as you get, there's a crick running here, and so the properties get a little bit more funky in size and shape when there's odd, uh, odd natural features to deal with. Or many times, they're just very symmetrical pieces, either quarters or halves or things like that. So here is a picture of a plat book uh, page that I've scanned to include as part of this presentation. And you can get a plat book, if you've never heard of it, it's, like I said, it's a graphical description of property ownership within a township and within a county. You can go to your county clerk's office to get a copy of it or the county extension office to get a copy of your plat book or call first to see which one sell them. Sometimes they both do. And uh, this, I wanted to point out some of the features on this page. You can see here's the name of the township at the top, where it's located within the county. This happens to be in Oneida County. You can see the descriptions of the number of uh, townships north of the, of the uh, baseline and the number of ranges east of the principal meridian. In this case, there's two townships. It's, it's, it displays two townships here, and in fact, they're separated by this yellow line. So this is Pine Lake, and this is uh, Newbold, the two townships. Also displayed are the highways. Uh, you can see the, and some water features in blue. And you might see some colored parcels, not all white, but colored. This, these are green and these are yellow. That usually indicates some kind of public ownership. It can indicate, and it can also indicate different things. So it's a good idea if you're not unsure is to look in the, the, the legend of the, the description at the beginning as to what each of these colors mean. In this case, the green means it's owned by the United County. It's a part of the United County Forest. These yellow mean that it's owned by the Wisconsin Board of Commissioners of Public Land. Now, as you look at this plat book map, you can see something right away in that none of these lines are very straight, and that's actually very common for a couple of reasons. One of them is that the earth is, is a curved surface, and so the lines will never be perfectly straight. 
because of that. The other one is that we're human beings, and especially when they were first out establishing the section, the, the township corners, they were using some very simple tools, very crude tools compared to the ones we use today. And so, well, I shouldn't say very crude. They're, they're simple tools compared to the ones we use today. And uh, so there, you can imagine them out in the, uh, trudging through swamps and around lakes and, and uh, around other natural features that sometimes these lines aren't perfectly straight. And it really depends on the, uh, the surveyor at the time and how good a job they did. If it was, there was no other water features or anything and it was perfectly flat, these lines might come close to being perfectly straight and these squares might be close to perfectly being square, but more often than not, that's not the case. Another thing you'll notice on the plat book page is these arrows between blocks of ownership. And that indicates that it's, it's, it's the same owner that own, the same person owns both of those ownership, both those blocks of land. So here's Herb Wolf. He owns this 80 acre parcel of land. And he owns this 40 acre parcel of land because they're connected with this little arrow. Same with George Bratz. He owns this 80 acre parcel and this 40 acre parcel. Now they could have just wrote George Bratz in here and Herb Wolf in here, but that can, it can tend to get the, the, um, the page very cluttered. And so by just connecting these things with arrows, it's a bit cleaner and easier to read to some degree. And, it, and to some degree, the, the people that were creating this were lazy and didn't want to have to write George Bratz and Herb Wolf again and again and again. So that's something, another feature you're going to see very commonly in our plot book maps. Okay, so let's, I, I zoomed in to a part of the map, and it's, I apologize that it's a little fuzzy. But let's go through a little exercise in, in trying to discover and identify where your property boundaries and corners are. Let's say you are Francis Bosetsky, and you own this 101-acre parcel of land right here. And you can see that it's, you, own both, you own both sides of this, this road that passes through here. And you're a little troubled because this parcel, this 40-acre parcel right here, used to be owned by Consolidated Papers, a paper company that, that just came on here and harvested timber every 40 years, and that was it. But now they sold it to a private individual, and there's all kinds of activity on here. And you wanna, you're concerned that they're trespassing on your property. And so you want to identify where these corners are and where this property boundary is. Now, it's, you can see that this corner of your property is very easy to identify. It's right at the intersection of these two roads. So that one you won't have a problem identifying at all. This one, you can kind of see where it is. It's right at the inflection of this road where it turns, where it curves a little bit. And so you can kind of see where that property boundary is. It's not bad. But these two, it's going to be really hard based on this plot book map, map to identify where this is, or where these corners are, especially since you don't have a survey. So I want to introduce a tool, I want to introduce but reintroduce a tool that Chris described in the very first presentation. And it's a, it's a, a mapping tool called WebView that you can access at the DNR website at dnr.wisconsin.gov slash maps, the Wisconsin DNR website. And it's, it's a really good tool to help you to identify some of the features of the landscape that's out there and helping, and in this case, helping you to find out, to give you a clue as to where your corners might be. And so I loaded this layer that, just, that shows uh, like uh, the section names, here's section four, section three, section nine, and 10, and the, and the township, the section uh, boundaries, and the quarter and quarter lines within the section. That's these gray lines here. It also shows the roads. This is River Road and Hillstrom Road. So you, as Francis Bosetsky, you can see here's your ownership. Well, that's still pretty, that doesn't help you a lot, but if I add a little bit more information to it, it'll actually help quite a bit. So let's add another layer to this. In this case, we've added a layer called a topographic layer, or the topographic map. And this is all available at the same website. You can add these things. So I just, you can still see, you can kind of see the quarter lines, these light gray lines. And now you can see the roads a bit more clearly here. And here's this gravel road here. So there's a number of features I should describe within this map. And I said this, it describes topographic features, open land, forested land, swamp, open water, things like that, and roads. So the blue, this blue, open blue, is lakes or open water. The white is some kind of open land. It could be a field. It could just not be forested or something like that. The white with these little blue tufts in it means open swamp. So that's, this is swampy land, and this, where the green, the green is forest, and the green with the blue tufts in it means forested swamp. And that's, forested swamp is very common in Wisconsin. Black spruce and tamarack are very common forest swamp species. So we've got a lot of going on here as well. So this is, so this could be an open field. Here's a lake. Here's uh, a swamp made up of some kind of grasses or sedges or brush. 
and then the rest of this is forested. And this is forested swamp with the blue uh, little tufts in it. Now there's also these lines with numbers on them. And these lines designate a change in elevation. In this case, it's a change in elevation of 10 feet. So there's a 10 foot difference in height between this line and this line in, in the land. And uh, as you go, if you see these circles, that indicates the top of a hill. So there's a little bit of a ridge right here. And this goes downhill to this swamp. This goes downhill to this swamp. There's another little ridge over here. It's downhill to this swamp and downhill to this swamp in every direction. So this is 10 foot difference in this line. Here's 1570, 1580, 1590, 1600. Right here's the top of this hill, feet above sea level. So you can get an idea a bit about what the landscape is like. And here's uh, Francis's your property. It's kind of flat. There's not much of a change in elevation. There's a bit of a forested swamp. The steep hill over here, when the lines get close together, it means that it's the, the landscape's a bit steeper, the hill's a bit steeper than if they're farther apart. So it's a very gentle kind of terrain. You can see for a couple things that are important for this map, that uh, one of these corners right here is within a forested upland area. So there's no swamp where this corner is, and it doesn't look like there's swamp where this corner is either. So that's giving you a bit of a clue as to uh, where your corners might be. But it's, it's not, there's, a, there's a, even a better source to help you figure that out, and another source. And I'm going to go to that next. And here's an, a photograph taken from the air of the same piece of land. And these, every five or ten years, so, uh, a company will fly across the state taking photographs of the entire state. And you can order these pictures or just download them off the, this website if you'd like. So you can still see these roads. Same roads, everything's exactly the same except that we have this photo in here. And here are the lines of the quarters. Okay, so let's look at some of these features. Now, you remember I said this was open swamp, but you can tell this is how this kind of fuzzy in here. That means that there's shrubs in there. This is probably just grass. And these are these, these, these trees all in a row here are probably a, a conifer plantation. In fact, I know these are red pine plantation here, all planted in rows right here. And then these kind of fluffy ones what looks like fluff here is actually upland forest. This is conifer and this is a hardwood forest. And here's some more open land and this one has some swamp in it with um, some brush in it too. So okay, knowing a little bit of like that, you can kind of get some more information about where your corners are located. Now if you see this one right here, it's kind of close to at the edge of the forest, where, where, right where it gets open. So that's going to help you figure out exactly where that point is. This one's going to be a little bit harder because there's no real distinguishing features in here, other than it's kind of close to the edge of this swamp. And uh, beyond that, it might be a little bit more difficult. But this is another tool you can use to help you identify where your corners are and where, where your land is located and what the features are within your land to help you decide. So if you're, if you're walking through your land and all of a sudden you hit a big opening and you're not sure where you are, you're pretty sure you're off your property if you're over here because you don't have an opening like that within your forest. So I encourage you to take a look at this site and play with it a little bit and, and um, see if it helps you at all to figure out what, to, what your landscape is like on your property and where your corners might be. Now, if there happened to have been a survey done on your property, you'll find some, you most likely find some kind of monument if indeed they did place a monument on the corners. Now, they might not have placed the monument because the person who had surveyed didn't specify that they should or not. But if they did, it might have, if it was a very important corner, like it was a township corner for the whole county, the very first one, you might have a cement pedestal like this with a brass top on, a brass ring on top of it or brass disc, I should say, that describes exactly where it is. Most of us don't live in those kind of locations, so we might, if it had been surveyed and they put in a monument where the corner is, might have a stake or a pile of rocks or a cross on the top of the rocks or just an iron pipe with a bend in it to make sure it stays in the ground. Now that's if it had been surveyed and if the, the monuments are still there that haven't been knocked over by a tree falling down or you're running over it with your truck or something or your neighbor running over it or, or something like that. So uh, if it is there and it's still intact, that's what you should be looking for. I talked a little bit about some of the getting out and trying to find them, your corners yourself. Uh, I talked a little bit about using your pace, 66 feet, uh, for a chain, and you can uh, rattle off the chain as you walk along. It actually is pretty easy, and, and uh, you can be pretty accurate once again. Using a, a compass is the first way I learned how to traverse through the woods. Here's a picture of a compass and a map. It's actually another way to be pretty accurate, unless you're over some uh, magnetic formations in the ground. 
it, it's usually a pretty accurate way to find your way in the woods. You can either do it alone or with another person to be out with a compass. A lot, a lot of people have turned to these global positioning system units. They have them in, a lot of folks have them in their cars that tell them where to turn to find a certain place. And, but there are handheld units that you can use, where's my pointer, like this one right here, when you're out in the woods or anywhere to find a location. And it uses satellites to, to determine exactly where you are. Now the downside of these handheld GPS units is that they require a signal from a satellite for them to work right. In, in the open, they work great. When you're underneath the canopy of a forest, especially in the summer, the, the signal can get blocked. And your accuracy, that affects the accuracy of, of determining where you are. So if you're out in the open, the accuracy might be put you within three feet of exactly where you are. But if you're in a forest, it might be 30 feet away or even up to 300 feet away, depending on your location. So keep that in mind as you're using these, the, a GPS unit in the woods, that accuracy might be limited to uh, based on your location, especially if you're in a valley or uh, if there's a lot of trees above you. They work pretty well, and, and uh, I'd say give it a try if you're trying to find your corners. If you're not having much luck using a compass and pace, try, if you don't have one, borrow one. They're not that expensive. A couple hundred bucks will get you a nice recreational unit that'll work pretty well. And you can type in a location in some of these, and it'll take you right to where you need to be, which is, can be really easy. <laughs> So, but say you you can't find that those corners, and you really need to know where they are. And so, and to, for a number of, for a number of reasons, you might consider having someone come in and conduct a survey on your property. Some of these reasons include um, the your property is be you're dividing up your property, or or, par, or cutting off a part of it to give to uh, a son or a daughter or something. And it's a good time to get the the the, the land surveyed. If you're selling the land. That's a good, another good time to get land surveyed so the new owner knows exactly where they're getting and you're describing it accurately. If you're putting any improvements on the property, you probably might need to get a survey done, especially it's a good thing to check with the county if you're putting in an addition to your house or you're putting in a septic field or something like that. It's a good idea to, to check with the county to see if you need to have a survey done to, so those places can be identified exactly. So those, I'm sorry, what you're putting in, what you're building can be identified exactly. It can be located precisely so that to make sure you're the correct distance away from any property boundaries. Sometimes you're required by the state, federal, or county government, or town government to, to have a survey conducted for a number of different reasons. Maybe you're near water and you put your building something as I already mentioned, or something else. There's all kinds of reasons where you might be required to have a survey done. Uh, Fortunately, it doesn't happen that often, but it could happen. And like I said, maybe you're uncertain as to where your corners are, and you might have a dispute between you and your neighbor as to where the corners and property boundary is, or you're you're afraid that, or you're seeing that you're thinking that someone is trespassing on your property, and you want to make sure that indeed that's the case or not, or maybe that someone is encroaching upon your property and they're they moved their fences too far onto your land and using your land instead of their own. It's another good reason to have a survey done. So what it'll do or show? What will happen when you get the surveyor out? It doesn't have to be a man. I know that's kind of a dated picture. It doesn't have to be a man. But it, uh, what, what are they going to show? That Well, they can show a lot or a little depending on how much you're asking them to do and how much you're willing to pay for. The more you're asking the surveyor to do, the more expensive it's going to be to have this process done. But they can establish the boundaries of a property between one or the other. They can establish the corners. Or, they can in, they can locate where your improvements are, where your buildings are, your septic fields, things like that. They can they can tell you exactly where they are, and then they can create a map of all of this, and then file it with the county and record it with the county if that's what you like. Again, the more stuff you ask them, the more expensive this is all going to be. But that's something they can do, and, and and if you have the time and and inclination, and they're willing to agree to it, you can travel along with them as they do their work on your property. And I encourage you, if you can, to ask them, and then just don't be a pest, but follow along and see what they're doing and, and, and ask questions if they start. If you're asking them to, to establish boundaries, to show where the boundaries are, they might use paint, paint or flagging to identify boundary trees or, and show, show and establish a visual cue as to where the boundary is between the two properties. It's a good idea to watch them as they do that, maybe take notes so that years later, uh, you know where those are, and then you can keep establishing them if, the, say, the paint starts to wear off or the flagging starts to degrade and fall down, or your neighbor decides they want to move some stakes or something. Make sure you've taken notes so you can re restore those to where they were before. How do you find a surveyor? Well, 
In fact, we're lucky in Wisconsin, or probably in many states this is true, that the surveyors are licensed here in the state, and you only want to work with a licensed surveyor. And so I encourage you, if you're looking to uh, get a surveyor, to visit the, the Wisconsin Society of Land Surveyors website, wsls.org, to find a surveyor. And it's, there's a link right at the top of the page that says find a surveyor. And you can learn a little bit more about them, uh, what surveyors do, what their society does. And I like the idea of working with someone that's affiliated with a professional organization. That says to me that they're committed to the profession. It's a, a bit more important for for a forester or a logger because we're not licensed, we're not really certified by the state. And so anybody can say they're a forester or a logger, but it, and, and anybody can paint some put some paint on the side of the truck, throw a chainsaw on the back, and say they're a forester or a logger. But at least this affiliation with a professional organization shows their commitment to the profession. And this is true for surveyors as well. So I encourage you, I don't, I don't get any kickback from the Wisconsin Society of Land Surveyors. I think it's just a good place to start. And I encourage you, take a look at their website, especially if you're thinking about hiring a surveyor. I said costs can, can depend on how much you're asking of them. It, they can depend on, they can, can they can depend on other things as well. Say the condition of the record. Maybe all you have for the record, there's no survey on record, and all you have is a legal description that you own the southwest of the southeast of Section 21 range, township, township range, whatever. So there's just a, a broad description of where your property is, but no record of where your corners, no survey done of the corners and boundaries. So that it'll, charge, it'll cost you more if that's the case. If you have a recent survey done and they're just checking that survey, it'll cost you less. But if the survey was done, say, in the 1920s or 1890s or something like that, a very old record, they might, it might be uh, different. The conditions might be such that they're not able to get as accurate uh, a find those points as easily from the recorded survey. So it might cost you more because of that. The terrain can make a big difference. Obviously, if it's very flat land, it's, it's easy to survey compared to a very hilly land, especially those with cliffs. So that, that's going to affect how much a survey is going to cost. Weather can be uh, important, too. Uh, uh, if it's, say, if it's in the middle of winter and you need to have a survey done, it might be, uh, they might charge you more than if it's another time of year. The best time of year might be in the spring or in the fall when there's no leaves in the trees and it's still nice enough weather that they're not freezing out there trying to, to find the corners and establish the boundaries. They, and in, how complex is all the stuff you want them to do? They can reestablish or find the monuments that if there were a survey there, or establish corners or put in some monuments, like a very stakes or, or iron pipes or cement posts or something, whatever you want. The more you ask of them, the more it's going to cost you. Excuse me. Okay. So you maybe so you got the survey done, or you haven't had the survey done, and you and your neighbor have a are. Um, disputing as to where the boundary is, where the corner is and where the property boundary is. And maybe you've each had a survey done and they don't jive. They're off by a few feet. And so you have to decide where the corner is and where the, where the, the boundaries are. And if it, if, uh, if it is off and it's, your neighbor's been using your property for the past 30 years and you didn't know it, it could be what's called adverse possession. I'll get a bit more of that in, the, in a few minutes. But what you can do if you, if you realize that, look, we, we're not exactly sure where this where this line or these corners are, and um, we can't come to or uh, the, the surveys that we had done don't are off a couple of feet. We couldn't just you can just establish a new line of where the property boundary is called a line of agreement. And uh, if you're going to do that, you you have to work with everybody that that is tied to the ownership of those parcels, including the banks that hold mortgages. But you can establish a new line of agreement that where that where the boundary is. But if you still can't decide, you can't resolve it with your neighbor and you decide you want to take it to court, you, it's what's called a declaration of interest in real property. And if it's, um, you need to do it as quickly as po possible when you discover that there might be something wrong. If it's been decades that this has been going on, you probably won't have much of a case. But if it's just started in the last couple of years, you have a lot stronger case to make to enforce your right on your property. So. Get out there. Once, if you get a survey done or if you finally found your corners and you think you know where your property boundaries are, get out there and walk the lines at least once a year. If you've had it flagged or painted where the boundary is, 
go out there and make sure that stuff is still on the, on the trees or the stakes are still out there or your corners are still there where they're supposed to be. Make sure that people, there isn't anything new going on from your neighbors. They're not crossing property lines or not use, utilizing your property or something like that. Get out there and walk your land at least once a year. Here's another excuse to get out and have some fun on your property. I, I want to talk briefly just about access to your land. Now, you can, there's parcels that don't have, parcels of land that don't have uh, road frontage. And so without road frontage, it can be hard to get to your property unless you have a helicopter. Many times with road parcels that don't have road frontage, we have, we get access to property via uh, what's called an easement over someone else's property. That's not guaranteed. And in fact, uh, people have often bought landlocked, or I call landlocked parcels that, uh, and cannot get access and they have to go to courts to get access. But an easement, a written easement that's that's tied to the deed and it's signed by uh, both neighbors is the best situation to be in if, you, if your parcel doesn't have a road frontage. Because the goodwill of the neighbor might change and that's, there's no guarantee that the next owner will agree to that easement. You can get a prescriptive easement uh, done by, the, by a judge, obviously that's going to cost you money, or you can get the town board to condemn a right away for you, and which is not necessarily very likely. It does happen, but it's not as likely. So if you have a, a parcel of land that doesn't have road frontage, uh, then you might have issues that you need to resolve with uh, talk to a lawyer or talk to the county clerk to see what your situation is. Okay, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about some of the legal issues surrounding uh, owning forested land. I want to start off by saying that I'm not a lawyer. I have a bit of knowledge about some of these laws that I'm happy to share with you, but uh, you, it ultimately you may need to turn to uh, the lawyer, a lawyer or especially talk to your county clerk if you've got things you can't figure out or resolve. If you're a member of the uh, Wisconsin Woodland Owners Association, there was a, an issue of their magazine in the fall 2000 that had a lot of great information about these issues, legal liability and trespass and fence laws. Let's start with the recreational use statute. It limits your liability if someone happens to get hurt or injured on your property. It says that you do not have a duty to inspect your property to keep it safe or to give warning of an unsafe condition. Because when I get to the trespass, trespass law, people I'm going to describe how people are responsible for knowing where they are in, every, anytime they're out in the woods. So you're not responsible to, or have a duty to inspect your property, keep it safe, or give warning. Unless you give permission for people to use your property, then it changes completely. But Ultimately, if you're the only one who uses your property, you don't have any access, you don't have a responsibility to keep it safe in, this, in these ways. Now, recreational use activities is described as anything except organized team activities. So it could be uh, individuals skiing or hiking on your property, or it could be uh, individuals snowmobiling onto your property. But if it's a, uh, the high school ATV team, that you've invited to come and recreate on your property or practice on your property, that's an entirely different situation. That's an organized team activity, and then you might be liable then. Now, it says you don't, you, it, the law says that you, you sh you're not liable for damages, but it doesn't mean you won't be sued. And given our society today, people are, are not afraid to sue over small things or, or to try and make some money or something. So uh, you could still be sued, even, but you might have a strong case if you follow this the recreational use statute. Now, if you would, be li you would be liable for damages if you allow access to your land, you give pre people permission to come onto your land, and fail to disclose a known hazard, or maliciously create one. And that's actually in the, in, that's language in the law. If you maliciously create a hazardous condition on your property and invite someone on. I laugh, but it probably has happened. That's why they had to write that into the law. But it's say you invite people to come onto your property for some activity, whatever it may be, and you have a a very dangerous cliff on your property and you don't tell them about it, then you could be liable for damages or if, it, if they're injured. Or say you have an old barn on your property and it's falling apart and it's, it's about ready to fall over. You invite people over and they, you don't tell them about it and they go into it and someone gets hurt. You could be liable. Another situation is if you accept money from people to use your property for whatever reason and if it's over $2,000, then you could be liable for damages. And so the key is $2,000 in a year. And so the key is that $2,000 number. If you're going to accept money from people to use your land, make sure it's under $2,000 so that you're not liable if they get injured. There's a couple other circumstances to keep in mind. If, um, if you have a guest, you invite someone to use your property, and um, they get injured, 
well, let me back up. They, let's say you invite your, the, like the, let me give you an example. Say that you're, you're tapping some of the maple trees in your property to create maple syrup, and you invite some people over to, for a kind of a fun weekend to do that. They go and they collect buckets from the trees and bring it over, dump it into the vats, and, and you boil it off. It's a fun thing to do all day. If they get injured while doing that, which you've explicitly invited them over to do, you could be liable. Now, if they decide that they're going to go running through the woods and you didn't invite them to do that, then you might, then you wouldn't be liable because you're inviting, you're, they're not participating in what you invited them over to do. Another circumstance is, say you invite a group of people over for a dinner party. So the idea is they just stay in your house and they're, they participate in this dinner party. Now, if someone within that dinner party decides they want to go and walk through the woods, and, the, and they get a certain distance away from your house, say over 300 feet, <laughs> I don't know why 300 feet, but 300 feet, they get with 310 feet away from your house and get injured while they're walking through the woods, you would not be liable because they're participating in an activity that you did not invite them over to do. So if you invite them over to, at your house and they get injured while you're doing stuff that you invited them to do, then you could be liable. But if they're out doing something on your property, just like a trespasser then, you're not liable for the, if they get injured because they're not doing what you had invited them to do. Another situation is if you hire someone to do some work on your property and they get injured in that work, you could be liable for injuries. And so you need to check with them to make sure that they have their own liability insurance before they do any work on your property. And what I've been told is that if you're going to ask someone for, to see the proof of their liability insurance, you should give them a couple days because it, it, they might have to get a copy from their insurance agent. And so if you're talking to someone that might clear some trails on your property and say, okay, you want to come out and take a look at it, give me a couple days, give them a couple days to, to make sure they have a copy of their insurance so they can bring it to you and show it to you before you hire anybody. So there's, there's a few things you can do to protect yourself. One is to remove any hazards that are out there, like the old barn. If you've got an old falling down barn, knock it over, destroy it so that it's not a hazard at all. If you have a cliff, make people aware that it's out there. Tell them that it's out there. Put up signs that it's out there. Block access to it if you can. <laughs> you know this is a sad thing to do in our society, but if you're inviting people over and you're really worried about liability, you can develop written releases for them to sign so that they won't sue you or, or uh, uh, if in case they get hurt. I know it's a sad thing, and if you've got friends coming over asking them to do that, it's kind of a sad thing that, to do, but if you really want to protect yourself, I encourage you to do that. Also establish some written rules for how the activity is going to take place on your property. If you're going to, you want inviting people over to collect sap and boil it down, you just say, okay, this is what we're going to do. You walk with the buckets, you don't run, you dump it down in here, and you don't go anywhere else. Those are the rules. Or uh, if you're going to be walking on my trails, you stay on the trails, you don't run, you don't uh, ride ATVs on them, stay on the trails, and, you, uh, and everything will be okay. Now, if you're going to have a special activity on your property, it's a good idea to get, like, Many landowners will invite a class of, of elementary or high school kids to come on their property learn a bit of, about forestry and forest management and, and about how they're managing their forest. It's a great activity. A lot of people do it. If you're going to do that, I would encourage you to talk with your uh, insurance agent about getting just a one-time special event or activity liability insurance um, premium, I guess. No. Yeah. <laughs> get some insurance for an activity or event. And uh, it does. It's a couple hundred bucks, but it's a, a great way to protect yourself. So let's move on to trespass law. Now, when I've showed this slide many times, and people have said, "Where can I get that sign?" and I, I said, "Well, I just went on the internet and did a Google search for trespass signs, and this one came up." So if you really want that one, you, I encourage you to go online and do that. But trespass is defined as any person who enters your land or stays without your specific permission. That's as clear as it can be. And in 1996, they revised the law here in Wisconsin. And it shifts the responsibility to re people doing recreation knowing exactly where they are. It's an away from your responsibility as a woodland owner to describe where your property boundaries are. And so you no longer have to post no trespassing signs all around the property, all around the borders of your property. And it, for one of the reasons I did that was because there was just millions and millions of all these signs all over the place along every road, and so it was kind of an, an eyesore, and that's why I have aesthetics in this, in this line here. One of the reasons I put this law in effect because of that. But it's a responsibility of the people walking across the landscape to know where they are, and it's not your responsibility to tell them where they are. Of course, there's a but. 
and the but is if you own land that borders any kind of public ownership, whether it be a national forest, a state forest, state wildlife, wildlife area, county forest, whatever it may be. I even had a landowner who said that they had problems and they own land next to a cemetery. It's a you need to uh, post your land. Then, so people know who are pub who can use public lands. It's free to their use. They know exactly where the boundary is between the public land and the private lands. And the guidelines I've read state that you should use signs that uh, are about 11 by 11 inches and di 11 inches by 11 inches. They're uh, they have a place where you can sign your name on it and make sure you do that. You have to put your name on it to describe the owner. You post them about four feet off the ground and you post about two signs every quarter mile. So if you own 40 acres, a 40 acre parcel. You put two signs on every side of that parcel. And if you want to put them on the corners too, I encourage you to do that. If there's a road, I encourage you to put more signs next to the road. But that's the general guidelines for posting your land. Now, ignorance of the law, which many trespassers might claim is, I didn't know that was the case, or I didn't know where I was, is not a valid defense. And, but and, but I, uh, I encourage you not to take it into your own hands to evict trespassers from your property. I encourage you to call the county sheriff, especially if it's a, if it's a, a thing that keeps happening over and over again. And the rules state if you're a deer hunter and shoot a deer, and the deer happens to run onto a neighbor's property, you have to get permission from that landowner to cross onto their property to get a deer. If you can't get a hold of the landowner, you have to contact the conservation warden to come and get the deer. And let, hunters are not allowed to go onto private property unless they have permission to, to go after a deer. Oh, and uh, one more thing, one more note I wanted to mention is that um, to protect, another thing to protect yourself, if you've got a gate, make sure it's uh, across a road, make sure it's really visible so that people, for a couple of reasons, so that people don't run into it and injure themselves and might cause a headache and liability stuff, but that they don't de destroy your, your gate. And, and some people just put a wire across an op a roadway. I, uh, one of the recommendations I've seen is to put a piece of PVC pipe on the wire to make it more visible or put some reflective things on the PVC pipe. Something to make it more visible so that even if they're not hurt, they're still destroying your, your gate and you have to rebuild it every time. Let's move on to squatter's rights. Well, I'm running out of time quickly. The squatter's rights are just that, taking ownership by using someone's property over a period of time. There's a number of conditions associated with it. It must be openly, hostily, and continuously occupied or used, and that use must, must be substantial. It must be cultivation, growing crops of some kind. Uh, it must have some kind of improvement, putting in a house or a septic field, fencing that uh, cuts into your property so that they can use it more, and a cutting of firewood are all good examples of substantial use. A mistake lot line is not adverse possession. It usually this usually occurs when a neighbor puts up a fence that too far into your property, and then they start using that land for cultivation or, or cattle grazing or something. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. And there's certain circumstances where if they just put up the fence, say it's been 22 years that they've had the fence up on your property and been grazing their cattle on it, then that's that's all they need to, to make a claim that they own the land. But if, they, if they've been up for less, fewer years, and they've had other things going on, like they've had a written document or a deed or a judgment from the judge that says that uh, they can use the land and they pay taxes or they have a written document, and it's been 10, late, 10 years or less, they can take possession of the land. These, these two cases I'm not as familiar with, the seven and 10 year circumstances, but if it's been more than 20 years that they've been using the land, they, have a, they can make a good case for taking adverse possession of the property. And here's a couple of examples. Maybe your neighbor has put up a building that's two feet over your line or has built a garden onto your land. The thing to do is to kick them off. It can be easy if it's a garden. It's not as much of a, a substantial um, investment in, in building. But if it's a structure they put in with a foundation, it can be a lot harder. What you can do is, if, they, if they're loath to move a building, is to give them permission in writing that says they can use the land but not take possession. And I encourage you, and I might say this a lot, I encourage you to, that's why we walk our property boundaries to see what's going on. And, and if someone looks like they're starting to do some construction, make sure you know exactly where your line is, your property boundary is, so you can uh, make sure they do too before they start building too close. And I, now, when you start bringing lawyers in, that's when it starts to get expensive. But if, you, if you're unsure about how this should work or what your rights are, I encourage you to talk to a lawyer to get some more information. I'll finish with a brief discussion about fences. Uh, fences, uh, again, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I know a little bit about fences, and um, 
and I'm hoping to share those with you today. They're not necessarily boundaries between properties. Fences don't necessarily identify where the boundary is, but they, they can be right on the property boundary. And if they've been there long enough, they might become the property, the de facto property boundary. And you as a woodland owner may need to build a fence or may help to maintain a fence. Chapter 90 in the Wisconsin Statutes describes the fence law. And there's a great publication on our website about the fence law, so I'm not going to go into a lot of details about it. It's really a common sense approach to the, uh, the use and management of fences between property owners. Now, it was challenged a few years ago by the Wisconsin Woodland Owners Association, and their challenge was that since we as woodland owners, we don't, we're not grazing cattle, we're not raising crops, we're just, we just want a forest, we should not be responsible for maintaining a fence. And the judges said, nope. That's not, that's not the case. You still have to help maintain a fence. So as a woodland owner, you may need to help maintain a fence under certain circumstances. And if it's either of the properties that are used for grazing, it doesn't have to be just one, grazing or farming, a fence could be required. Now, the, both landowners may agree not to have a fence. Say it is, they're just uh, grazing corn or they're just uh, cutting the field for hay. So you really need a fence, and so you might agree, let's not have a fence and be done with it. And if you, that's the case, I encourage you to put it in your deed in writing if you can. Uh, but, if, but if indeed they're raising cattle and they want to put up a fence, you, you may be required to help maintain the fence. Unless, oops, I'm sorry, unless the neighbor says that they're going to cover all the expenses. And that'd be great, but it's not always the case. Now, who's, how you divide up the fence is, is uh, identified using a legal term called partition. It means to divide evenly. What, what the saying is that you pay for half the fence. And again, you may agree otherwise. And maybe one, the landowner that has, that's raising all the cattle may say, I'm going to take care of the fence completely. You don't have to have, deal with that. And so all of it's going to be signed over. Uh, you just need to make sure that's, that agreement is signed in writing and filed with the town clerk because all agreements are not binding on any present owners. And this is how it works. Say you're this, you're this landowner here, your farmer A, your farm A, and you're surrounded by three landowners who want to graze cattle. So you have, and this is the fence around your entire property. As you're looking, as you're standing and looking at your neighbor's property, if you look all the way over to the right where the corner is, you are responsible for maintaining the fence starting from there to the center of the fence. So as farmer A, you're responsible for this part of the fence. Same thing with the, with the landowner to the north. As you're looking at their property, you look all the way over to the right to the corner of the property right here. You're responsible from there all the way to the center line between of the fence. You're responsible for that part. Same with the landowner to the west. If, you're, if, you're, if it's a road and you want fence, then you're responsible for the whole thing. So that's how it works. That can be kind of confusing, but you're responsible for the right side of the fence, basically. And, you're, and you're, the other landowner is responsible for their right side of the fence as they're facing the fence. Water can be a fence. A creek or a river can be a fence between two properties. If it's uh, shallow then, and you want to put up some kind of man-made fence, it has to be on either side or you can alternate between sides. It cannot cross the, the stream or creek. You have to be able to allow people to utilize the body of water, whether to boat or to walk it. If you've got a dispute about your fence, uh, you, you, go to, you go to the town board and they appoint what are called fence viewers. They're usually town supervisors to come out or talk with you about what the dispute is and, and resolve the fence issues. There's a number of different things that fences can be made out of. I want to draw your attention to the electric one. The, if, if a landowner wants to put up an electric fence, it has to, both landowners have to agree to it. and have to agree to it in writing. It has to be at least two wires. So if someone comes to you and says, we're putting up an electric fence and you don't want to, you do not have to agree to that. And good fences make good neighbors. I encourage, I encourage you, once again, <laughs> uh, to work to establish good relationship with your neighbors. Save yourself a lot of money in legal issues, and if you can resolve things on your, more, on, on your own, that's more, that's more power to you. You'd be a lot happier. There's a lot of resources out there. I want to point your attention to this book if you want to get some more information about the legal and financial practical matters. It's called Owning and Managing Forests by Tom McAvoy. I think I'm just going to leave this slide up as I finish. Uh, all of these publications are posted on, our, on the website for the webinar. So I, my, my last word is get out there on your property and keep an eye out. Try to find your corners and boundaries. And um, if you try to keep an eye on, on your boundaries to make sure nothing changes and learn a bit more about some of these legal issues if you think you have a problem with any of these. 
and we're right up against one o'clock and have to end. So I apologize that it went long, and I hope you got a lot out of this. If you have any questions that uh, Chris wasn't able to answer during the webinar, feel free to send me an email, and I'll be happy to uh, address them or or the ones that weren't addressed during the presentation by Chris. I'll be happy to address and send you something afterwards. But with that, I appreciate.